little story about a backslider, a guy that didn't come to church much, you know. Pastor hardly ever saw him at church at all. And all of a sudden, this guy starts coming to church every Sunday. And so after that happens a few Sundays, the pastor, as he's shaking hands with him at the door, he says to him, how wonderful it makes me feel to see you at services with your good wife. The fisherman said, well, preacher, it's a matter of choice. The pastor says, what do you mean by that? Well, the fisherman said, I'd rather have your sermon than hers. <laughs> well, see, sometimes it takes something to move people to come to church, doesn't it? Right. <clears throat> well, anyway, the Lord comes to you and me this day to speak to us, to lead and guide us as we come to him to worship him. And so the Apostle Paul, as he writes to the Ephesians, he writes to them concerning their Christian life. And that message comes down to you and me today also. Because he's telling us here that we need to be people that do not, we are not to live as people without Christ. He's telling the Ephesians, you're not to live like your heathen neighbors do. He's telling us here in America today, we Christians are not to live as those who are not in our world. Listen to what he says, and I use a different translation here of the first verses of our text today. So I tell you, and call on you and the Lord not to live anymore like the people of the world. Their minds are set on worthless things. Their understanding is darkness. Their ignorance and, and their closed minds have made them strangers to the life God gives. Having lost their sense of right and wrong, They've given themselves up to the, a life of, of lust to practice every kind of vice with greed. Hear those words. Those words ring true in our world today. Having lost their sense of right and wrong. And so often in our world today, people have lost the sense of what is right and what is wrong in their lives and in the world's lives and so forth, and we take what is wrong and we lift it up and praise it in our world today and in America. And so we got, Paul is speaking to America today just as he spoke here to the Ephesians so many centuries ago because we are in the same kind of way that they were too. We don't know what is right and what is wrong in God's sight in our world today. And so he calls on you and me then to be his messengers to be ones that are proclaiming the truth of God's word here in this world of ours. And so he's telling us here, he's telling us here that we grieve the Holy Spirit. We grieve him when we don't know what is right and what is wrong and when we practice what is wrong in our lives. We also grieve the Holy Spirit with bitterness. Listen to what he says on that. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. So he's saying, get rid of all bitterness. You know, sometimes in our life, it's easy to become bitter because of all the problems and the troubles that we face and, and everything seems to be going wrong in our life. And so it's very easy for us to become bitter. That's very true. And so Paul speaks to us about that. We also have a problem sometimes with uh, rage. We can get so mad and anger. He talks about anger and rage here, that that controls us in our life. And so he says, don't, uh, we are, then we are not to grieve the Holy Spirit with that either. And then he tells you and me also, he says these words, you, that we are to be ones that are not hurting our neighbor by what we say and what we do either. And here we have where the eighth commandment comes in for you and for me. Because we grieve the Holy Spirit if we're talking about our neighbor and running our neighbor or whatever out, person down. Listen to what the uh, Eighth Commandment says. It says, you shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. And in Luther's Catechism, is, what does this mean? He says, we should fear and love God so that we do not tell lies about our neighbor, betray him, slander him, or hurt his reputation, but defend him, speak well of him, and explain everything in the kindest way. Yes. He's telling us here our relationships with one another here in this world. That we are not to be ones that are running our neighbor down. We are not to be ones that are gossiping about others. We are not to be ones 
that are uh, they're betraying others by what we say concerning them and so forth. That if somebody tells you a secret, you can keep the secret. That's an important ingredient in our lives. And so, yes, we grieve the Holy Spirit when we break that eighth commandment in our lives, too. So what does the Lord want you and me to do? He tells us that here in our text, too. Listen to what he says here. He says, be imitators of God, therefore, as dearly loved children. He tells us we need to be an example to others. And how are we an example to others? We are an example to others when we imitate God. They tell us that back in, in the time of Jesus and so forth and earlier on, when they would teach people, like if they taught some, they were teaching somebody rhetoric, somebody to, that could make speeches and so forth, they would tell them that they should, they should listen to a great orator and they'd imitate him in order that they could be great in oratory. And so it's saying imitate, imitate a good example. Yes, we are to imitate a good example. And who is the good example we are to imitate? It's none other than the Lord himself. Clement of Alexander, uh, one of the great church fathers, said this once. He said, the true Christian wise person practices being God. Did you ever think of that? That when we want to live our Christian life, we practice being God, being God in the sense that we, that we live our life with love and mercy and grace unto others and so forth in our life, that we're helping others and so forth. Imitate God. Yes, we are to be doing that in our life. We are to show our faith by our actions. There's a little story that comes to us from some years ago about a guy by the name of Doug uh, Nichols. He was uh, in Operation Mobilization in India. And that was back in 1967. And so he was a missionary there. He didn't know the language where he was uh, working. And he came down with tuberculosis, TB. <clears throat> he was put in a sanitarium. And as he's in that sanitarium, he's in a big ward of all, of all, all kinds of other men that are there with TB, sick. He wakes up about 2 a.m. in the morning. And an old man in another bed uh, there in that ward is coughing and so forth and trying to get out of bed and can't get out of bed. Well, Doug doesn't uh, do anything about that. He just go, goes back to sleep again. And he finds out the next morning why this man was trying to get up because of the, the smell in the, in the room. He'd been trying to get up to go to the bathroom. And the other, the other people in there were cursing at this man and so forth, and the nurses treated him roughly and so forth as they cleaned everything up. Next night, Doug again wakes up about 2 a.m., coughing. And again, he sees this elderly man trying to get up out of his bed. He can't. Well, Dougie doesn't want to really get involved, but he, feel, he does also do, doesn't want to repeat it, what happened the day before. So he gets out of his bed, and he goes over to the old man there, and the old man is afraid of, as he comes over there. But he lifts that, the old man up out of bed, carries him to the bathroom. And when, he gets, when he's done in the bathroom, he carries him back and puts him in the bed. But before that, Doug had been trying to you know, give out Christian tracts to, to them there concerning in their language that they could speak and so forth, but they all turned him down. The next morning, after he'd done this with this old man, uh, one of the other patients came to him with a steaming hot cup of tea and asked him for one of his leaflets and one of his tracts that he gave. And others came up to him and asked for tracts also. Even the, some of the nurses asked for tracts and so forth. And, and a few weeks later, Another missionary came through the area that could speak the language. And as he visited with these people, he found some of them had read those tracts and some of them had come to faith in Jesus. You see, what moved the people was what Doug did. He was trying to do something and, and distribute things that they wouldn't accept. He was a stranger. But when he showed love, when he showed concern for another person, that spoke volumes. My friends, as we show concern and love for others, that speaks volumes in our world too, that we truly live our faith, that we truly are concerned about our fellow man, that we are truly witnessing Jesus unto others in our life by truly helping them. And so then we need to be an encourager. Listen to what Paul says. <clears throat> be kind and compassionate to one another. Be kind and compassionate. Those are not easy things to come by sometimes, but that's what the Lord calls on you and me to be kind and compassionate. He says this, do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth, but only what is helpful for building up others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. 
He says, build one another up. Building one another up is, is an uh, important ingredient in our life to encourage one another. There's a proverb among the Kisi uh, people of Liberia, and that's in West Africa, and the proverb goes like this. When a man steps into the center of a circle to dance and no one claps, he will soon tire and sit down. But if everyone claps, he will dance all night. That's encouragement, isn't it? Yes, that's, that's what the proverb is saying, to really encourage one another. You, you can do great things when you are encourage one another. And Norman Mailer, he, was a, he, he became a great author. But it's interesting, in, in the beginning, uh, Mailer went, uh, he, he went to Harvard University. And he went in there as an engineering student because his mother felt that that would be a best paying job he could, he could do. So he went in there as that. When his first year there, he was required to take English, English A. And in the English, in the English course, they were called upon to write a short novel. And Mailer wrote a short novel. And he received an A plus on that novel. Not many A pluses were ever given there, but he received an A plus. That truly encouraged him to be a writer. He finished his, his course uh, uh, civil engineering and that, but he's, he became a great writer and is noted as a great writer in America today. Yes, why? Because he was encouraged. He was encouraged there to be that, as uh, there at, he, at the university and so forth. You and I need to be encouraging one another. We need to be encouraging our children. We need to be encouraging our grandchildren our great-grandchildren, whatever they are, our friends and so forth. We need to be encouraging them in our lives. And yes, we encourage one another. That's what the Lord wants you and me to do. We need to give them unconditional acceptance. Listen to what Paul says. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sin, sun go down while you are still angry. Important little verse. I think many of us maybe remember it. Don't let the sun go down on your wrath on your anger. It's an important ingredient, isn't it, in, in our lives? Yes. There's a little story about a, a young man and woman getting married. Well, the husband, he knows that uh, anger needed to have an outlet. So this young man says to his bride, he says, darling, let, it ma let us make a rule. Whenever I become angry, I'll leave the house and go for a walk. And whenever you Whenever you get angry, you leave the house and go for a walk. Well, this couple lived a long life, a long marriage, and so forth. They were healthy individuals because they got so much fresh air. Well, my friends, that's, that's a good ingredient for us, isn't it? That yes, we can, we can get fresh air that way too, but yes, it's speaking to you and me. We need to settle our arguments. We need to overcome them in our lives and so forth. We need to do, we need to do away with it. Anger is a, a common emotion in us. We can't avoid it. It's how we deal with it that's important in our, in our, in our lives. At the conclusion of the Civil War, President Abraham Lincoln offered the, the lenient peace terms to the Confederates. And some of his advisors said this, you are supposed to destroy your enemies. Lincoln replied, that's exactly what I'm doing. Do I not destroy my enemies by forgiving them and making them my friends? I destroy my enemies by forgiving them and making them my friends. Wise words. It's too bad America, upon the death of Lincoln, didn't follow those words as they should have because the Reconstruction could have been much better in the South if, that, if those kind of terms had been followed more as Lincoln wanted them. That's for you and for me, too. We are to forgive one another, to forgive our enemies, to forgive those around us, and so forth. And so the, where does the power of our Christian life come to us? God comes to you and me. The power comes from him. Because he truly accepts you and me without doubt, without question. Listen to what uh, Paul uh, says. Forgiving each other just as in Christ God forgave you. God is not asking anything of us more than he does himself. We need to realize that. We are to forgive just as he forgives you and me all the time in our life. He does truly forgive us. Forgives us every day of all those sins. God unconditionally loves us. 
And we need to see that, that he truly unconditionally, he has, puts no conditions on loving us. He loves all, all human beings. He loves you and me. There's a little story about a traveler. He's going through the desert. And it's at night. And he, and he comes upon a Bedouin. And he comes to this Bedouin and asks him if he can't, you know, have, find lodging in his tent. And the Bedouin says, what do you call your God? And the traveler says, I don't believe in God. And so the Bedouin puts him out of his tent. Won't let him come in and so forth. During the nighttime, the better one is, he's troubled in his sleep. And God appears to him in his sleep, and he, he's, and he asks him about the guest that had come to his house. And the man says, I put him out of my tent because he had no God. And God said to him, if you will go outside and look up, you will see by the light of the stars a sky far greater than the roof of your tiny tent. I have not shut anyone out because he didn't know as much as he ought to know. If I can give shelter to the unworthy in my vast world, could you not give your unworthy guest a little shelter in your tiny tent? He speaks that words to you and me too, to reach out to others, to accept others into our lives also, because our Lord has accepted them and he's accepted you and me. And the greatest thing that Lord has done for us is give us life and life eternal. Listen to what Paul says. Live a life of love just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. The ultimate thing that our Lord in showing love for you and for me is the eternal salvation he earned for us. The ultimate love was not just that Jesus fed people, just that he healed people, that's just, that's just that he comforted people, but the greatest love is when that Lord went to a cross. He was nailed on that cross for you and for me. He died on that cross for you and for me and for all this world, for all those people out there that don't know him. Jesus died for them. He died for you and me. He atoned for our sins. And then he rose again from the dead and is that living Lord, and he says to you and me, go out. Go out and proclaim my message to others. Go out and live your faith. Go out and live as my children. Go out and show the love and concern that I show unto you. Show that unto others. That's what he's asking you and me to do. And that Lord, that living Lord, who rose again from the dead and offers us eternal life as we believe and trust in him, comes to you and me this day and he says in our gospel lesson, I tell you the truth, he who believes has everlasting life. I am the bread of life. Jesus is that bread of life. Hold on to him. Let that bread of life control your life and you will be a witness unto others. May his blessings be with each and every one of us. Amen.